Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're the host, Brett Wetzel, Kevin Compass, and we got a special guest tonight, Matt Asbill. Today, I don't know, I guess I was in, we were in class today, and we started talking about some things that were VFD oriented, and if anyone doesn't know VFDs better than Matt, I don't know who does. So there were some things that I had questions on that I wanted to get answered. One of those things that we talked about was sometimes when you measure voltage on the on the the drive using an RMS meter, sometimes it will read the 480 like it's supposed to, but then other times it doesn't. And that's what started me wanting to get this recorded with Matt. Matt, for the people that actually haven't heard you talk to us before, tell us a little bit about yourself or where you work at and what you do and tell everyone how you're the smartest guy with VFDs ever. I've been working for a company called Motion Industries for the last 30 years. My official title is electrical specialist and my role with our company, we have a, a sales force and we sell a lot of PT, power transmission products, as well as pneumatic, hydraulic, electrical bearings, you name it. And my role with our company is to assist the branches in my territory with electrical products and everything that revolves around electrical. So that'll be the VFDs, AC-DC drives, motors, fuses, switch gear, transformers, panels, anything that, that has wires leading to it. And basically I'm a support role, a technical support role. And I also get involved in technical support in the field. So I'm, you know, lots and lots of startups, troubleshooting, service calls and things like that. That's not my major role, but my, my function is a support, technical support role for our company. Cool. Matt, or Matt's been on with us at least once or well, actually it was just once, but it ended up being two episodes because I think we ended up talking for two and a half hours. So we'll see where this conversation goes. But yeah, tonight I wanted to delve into the, basically why, why sometimes we get higher voltages than, than what we typically do. And, and Matt, you've explained this to me before, where if you're, if you, the units program for 480, we should be typically getting 480 at at 60 hertz and then you will get about half of that if you're at half the frequency right because it, it does change the frequency but also changes the voltage correct that is correct and, and that's the that is the basics behind the volts per hertz term so most open loop drives will follow that linear pattern zero mm -hmm. to 460 volts is zero to 60 hertz and that'll be zero to the uh, nameplate base speed of the motor gotcha all right, well, I'm gonna throw this document up here and we can start, you can just direct me on where you wanna roll with this, but you told me you wanna start here at some of the inverter switching. Maybe you can describe what that is and why that's important. A couple, I mean, you told me a couple of different reasons, but I want you to go into it. I wanna hear it from your mouth when we're going over the, basically when we can see the document here. So the modern VFDs will use very high speed transistors to fire. Instead of relays, they use transistors and they're called IGBTs, insulated gate bipolar transistors. And that is basically how they fire the input in order to control the output. And so those transistors can be fired at a certain rate. And every VFD is gonna come out at a standard firing rate. It's called the carrier frequency or the switching frequency, depending on the VFD manufacturer. And those typically will come out in the industrial world at somewhere around 3,000 to 4,500 will be the starting frequency for most of that. At that speed or that frequency, that is typically most people can hear that frequency when it gets out from the VFD to the motor. So that will be the audible whine that you can hear when you're around a VFD. The faster it's going, the more audible that you can hear that. And what you hear that tone will be the IGBTs firing inside the VFD. So if you're in the industrial world, you're not really worried about the firing rate or the carrier frequency of your drive. If you're in the, the consumer world where you're in a building, you're doing HVAC, where you're in a high rise or a, a supermarket, or you're inside any place where people are, are living and working day to day, then you are concerned with the carrier frequency and you wanna make that as high as possible, which will take that audible tone away from it. So the people in the environment can't hear the firing rate of the VFD and the motors operating. And as we talked about earlier, 
you can look at this chart, and this will be the carrier frequency of a Danfoss VLT. And you'll see that it's anywhere from one kilohertz all the way up to 16 kilohertz. If, if you aren't worried about it, then you'll have that somewhere between one and four kilohertz. If you are worried about it and you wanted it to be as quiet as possible, then you would choose between six and 16 kilohertz where it would not make an audible ring for the consumers or for the people that were around this piece of equipment. Now, when you do this, in the industrial world, they'll come out as standard, like I said, between three and 4.5 kilohertz. You don't have to really worry about anything. If you're going to intentionally raise the default value up to a setting where you can't hear it, then you have to understand that this will produce extra heat inside the VFD because you're firing the transistors faster. So in many cases, depending on how high you raise the switching frequency or carrier, then you may have to derate the VFD because of the excess heat that you're producing. So if you had a 10 horsepower motor and you're gonna raise the carrier frequency up to 10, 12, 14 kilohertz, you may actually have to have a 15 horsepower VFD and by the time you derate it, it won't overheat when you're putting it on a 10 horsepower motor. So I, I just want to make sure I understand something so I'm explaining it properly. The switching frequency, when you were talking about, <coughs> excuse me, five kilohertz, that's basically how many times that it's pulsing one of its sine waves per, is that per cycle or per second? That's per second. So if yeah, we're looking at so, power and up math per second. So if all right, so if anyone doesn't know how this works, like a sine wave typically goes up positive and back down negative and just keeps going back and forth between there. So we're doing with a VFD, we're doing pulse width modulation. So we're essentially pulsing to essentially make a sine wave, correct? So you're basically pulsing that, that so fast that it's like if you say that the carrier frequency uh, the switching frequency is typically 4000 that means it's pulsing 4000 times a second in order to make that sine wave uh, yes and no it, it is going at 4000 transistor is firing 4000 times per second mm -hmm. but it's not making a complete sine wave in that one second each one of those pulses is making up part of the sine wave. Okay. So if you took a sine wave and you put a graph on it or put a scope on it, then mm -hmm. you would see that it would be filled with pulses of your DC bus. And so the faster you fire your transistors, the tighter your grouping is gonna be inside that sine wave. And the only way you could actually see how many pulses is you'd have to turn up the intensity of it to zoom into it to actually see how many pulses are going off within that one second of time, right? That is correct. You would need a oscilloscope to actually see that waveform is operating so fast. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Is there any other reason besides noise that you would monkey around with the switching frequency? Does that do anything for There's, torque? Uh, not necessarily for torque, but it does for amps. So we have been in situations where the the VFD was marginal and was overheating because it was a, a, a default standard out of the box, 10 horsepower drive. And it was on a heavy duty application mm -hmm. and it was just barely meeting the minimum of amps going to, let's say 12 and a half amps to a 10 horsepower motor. So mm -hmm. what we did in that particular case is we took the standard carrier frequency from four kilohertz down to one kilohertz which produced less heat inside the VFD itself because we were in a gray area because we needed 13, 14 amps and we could supply that current to the motor under heavy extreme conditions without overheating the VFD. But, but that's an extreme condition. The other case where we see carrier frequencies modified from the default value is if you start to put sine wave filters or other high-end motor filters on the output of the VFD, many sine wave filters are what they call tuned. And in order to meet maximum efficiency and protection level of this filter, it wants the VFD 
to be set at a certain carrier frequency. So oh. it may be default at three, but TCI or MTE, who makes reactors and sine wave filters and DVDT filters, inside some of their literature, they may say for maximum performance and 100% efficiency, you need to make sure that your switching frequency is set to 4.5 kilohertz. And, and that way your VFD and your filter are tuned so you'll get the maximum benefit out of it. And then, of course, the last one would be VFD manufacturers will produce a specific high carrier frequency, low harmonic. They'll produce very specific VFDs for residential or consumer use where out of the box, they're very quiet and the carrier frequency is very high. And what you'll find in those situations is the factory will go ahead through the derating process. So when you buy a 10 horsepower VFD that's already made for the HVAC world in like a high rise application, you're really getting a 15 horsepower drive and you're going to use it on a 10 horsepower motor where as you, if you bought, if you were going to buy an industrial VFD, and you're going to put it in the same application, then you would want to start off with a 15 horsepower because by the time you increased your switching frequency to where no one could hear the noise, then you would have to derate it back down to the 10 horsepower of which the motor you're going to connect it to. So by and large, the carrier frequency in my world is primarily going to be used to alter the audio or the frequency whether people could hear it or not. In the industrial world, they're not too worried about it. In the consumer and residential world, then they are worried about it. Does it does it do anything for the, because I don't, maybe you could explain once we finish through this, the harmonic imbalance. Does that help if you were to switch the transistor slower? Does that negate a, a little bit of vibration in some of these compressors that we're talking about, or would that not do anything? On the compressors, I don't know how that would impact compressors. I know that there's going to be, usually, if you turn the carrier frequency up or increase the switching frequency, it is actually better for the waveform going out to the VFD because, like I said, you're making smaller segments of the sine wave. And so mm -hmm. you have the ability to control your sine wave a little bit better. And your motor and drive application you can actually tune it a little bit better. Now, this is not very common in the industrial world, but by increasing the carrier frequency, you could make it a little bit better or more efficient on the motor side of things at the expense of heat inside your VFD. Yeah, so you'd have to you'd have to increase the size of your to your VFD in order to compensate for that then. Exactly. Okay. All right. Now, you, we were also talking about how the switching frequency could potentially correlate with the voltages that you see, like not ending up being what they are, like what they're supposed to be. Like as far as if you're, you tell it that it's supposed to be putting 480 volts out and you're putting 480 volts out, but yet you're still seeing you're still seeing a little bit of spikes. Is that because you're sending more precise shots to the sine wave and so you're smoothing it out naturally or is it something else with that well when you measure the output of a vfd your readings will only be as accurate as the meter that you're using and so it could be a simple auto ranging meter that will do ac dc everything at a glance or mm -hmm. you could have a three or four hundred dollar auto RMS, a true RMS meter that's going to take a, a better picture of what's going on. So okay. when I'm in the field and I'm looking at the voltage output of a VFD, then I'm only concerned with whether they are consistent readings with each other. And when you look at three phase input to a drive, you're concerned with consistency between the three combinations, L1, L2, L2, L3, L3, L1. You want it to be 465, 465, 465. So on the output, once I know the input is stable and, and equal, then I'll look at the output. And I'm not really concerned about the voltage that my meter is reading. I'm worried about consistency. If I measure 460 volts on the input, 
then I can measure 480, 490 on the output. But I'm after, I want to make sure A to B to C, C to A are consistent with each other, which tells me the VFD is putting out a symmetrical three phase to my motor. And so at that point, I'm not really worried about the voltage level I'm seeing on my meter. I'm worried about consistency with each leg to leg. If I want to know the actual voltage coming out of the VFD, if I don't have a true RMS meter, then almost all VFDs will have what they call the monitoring parameters. It will tell you the amps coming out, and it will tell you the power coming out, and it will tell you the voltage coming out. And so if I really want to know what the voltage is at, let's say we're going 45 hertz, and I want to look at that voltage level, I'll go to the monitoring parameters inside the VFD as opposed to looking at my meter. And I can do it safely that way as well. But the switching frequency, the IGBTs are firing so fast. Just like you said, they're making a PWM waveform. It's not a real pretty sine wave that meters want to look at. And so because of that firing rate, most digital meters will have a hard time looking at that. And it will interpret it the best it can. And it will usually come out higher than what the input voltage is. So 460 to 480 input can very easily be 480 to 500 volts on your meter just because of the inefficiency of the meter looking at the kind of waveform that's coming out of the VFD itself. All right, that makes sense. Kev, before I bring up any of these other pictures, you got any questions for Matt? And... No, I'm doing a lot of listening here. Okay. Like, uh, like he's throwing out a lot of good information. So I brought up, is this the table that you want me to bring up first, man? Yes. Ah, I lost it. Yeah. Okay. Let me zoom this in. Why can't I zoom in? No, there we go. What? What is going on? All right. You need to fire me. That's it. You just need to fire me right now because apparently I suck. <laughs> You're late. I don't know what my deal is. Share screen. You suck again. All right. So let me share that window. All right, so we got that going on. All right. Was that what you wanted me to share, that one or the other one? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. No, that's a good one there. And okay. so basically, if you look at this, like the standard carrier, fre carrier frequency, switching frequency in this particular case is an Emerson or Nidic drive. So it's mm -hmm. going to be in the three kilohertz range, which is very typical. And if you look at the cable length that, that they want to permit, then you can see that as you increase your carrier frequency to lower the audible noise, it wants you to limit the cable length going out to your motor as well. And that's because when you increase your carrier frequency, you're going to start messing with your harmonics and, and the output going to the motor. And so you don't want these things to keep ringing, going up and down for long lead lengths, causing additional problems on your motor. You don't want your motor and your VFD to be really quiet, but then your motor only lasts a couple of months because you've increased your carrier frequency. And so you have to, when you're planning a layout, for example, you have to look at this chart to make sure that you have a, a happy medium between the low audible noise and how far you're going to run your conduit to your motor. So are you more susceptible to more or less susceptible to basically arcing into the shaft at the higher carrier frequencies or lower? Um, in a nutshell, at the higher carrier frequencies. Now, each motor and motor manufacturer is built differently. And so mm -hmm. when I say that, that's, that's a general statement that the higher your carrier frequency, the more precautions you have to build into your system, let's say as simple as putting a shaft grounding ring on your motor, it's as simple as taking your, if you're going to use 10 gauge cable, you would use eight gauge cable. You want to make sure that everything's grounded real well. You'd have to make sure that you're running, uh, if you have two motors, for example, and they're both a hundred feet away from your control room where you have both your VFDs, then you'll want to run two separate conduits because you wouldn't want these six leads or two three phases inside the same conduit 
because they would overflow on each other and cause you additional problems. So in a general sense, the higher you do your carrier frequency to cause your less audible noise, the more careful you have to be with your entire system to make sure that you don't create another problem simply because you've raised the carrier frequency up to another level. And that 330 foot, that's basically the all the cable length, right? So if we're going to an air-cooled condenser where we have potentially 20 fans, that's every bit of that cabling from the outlet of that VFD, correct? You are correct, and most people don't see that or interpret that. And I've had contractors and technicians call me and say, I'm standing here in front of my 10 fan condenser, and I'm telling you right now, the furthest one away is 15 feet. And so what I do on the condensers that I'm familiar with, then if they tell me it's a 10 fan, then if you look at the cable lengths from each one of them back, then I use 15 feet as an average because the ones closer to you are going to be three or four feet. The ones further away could be 20 feet. And so I always try to be a little bit over it. So a 10 fan could easily be mathematically times 15 feet a piece, 150 feet of cable. And then if your VFD is inside a building or a rack house or not right next to the condenser, you're going to have to add another 20, 30 feet. So you could be anywhere from 150 to 180 feet by the time you're done. And that is the length of cable that you're looking at in the VFD world for noise or electrical disturbance going out to the motors. And that will usually define whether you need like an output reactor or an output motor, a sine wave filter or a DVDT filter, because anything over 75 to 100 feet, depending on what manufacturer you ask, you're going to start turning into or seeing some premature motor failures simply because the cable length is so long. And yes, the condenser world is very misleading because they're all within 15 feet, but you got 10 of them. And so you have to multiply them together. Now, Matt, is and it just better to always run a filter? Not necessarily. My rule is, depending on the economics of it, if you have a small condenser, what I would call a four or a six fan, then you could get by with either no output reactor, especially if the VFD was hanging off the side of the condenser, or if the condenser was inside a rack house and now you're looking at 50, 60 feet, you might get by with no reactor or you may get by with a simple reactor. But once you start looking at your eight and 10 and 12 fans, then you're gonna start like going up to a real motor filter, which I call the DVDT filter. And so it's all about, uh, it all comes down to how much money you want to put into the price of the reactor slash filter. A motor could easily be 350 to 500 bucks. And, and that's what some of these filters could cost. And so if you lose one motor, you could have put a filter in there or a reactor even and, and gotten a much longer life out of your motors. So, so it's a case by case, and we also have stores or we have locations that have really crappy power. See, it does a lot in Texas. The, the power <laughs> fluctuates, it goes up and down, it's just high, it's just nasty. Sometimes the facility or the location or the site that I'm in, it depends on their grid. And so if it's in a an area all by itself, they might have 500 volts going into the site or the location or the plant. And sometimes their voltage is going to be a little lower than that. But we have to consider where the plant is, where the store is, where the site is. Uh, and sometimes when we know that they have a high motor fail failure going into it, then that will also dictate we'll just jump right over from either no reactor or we'll just go right into the motor filter to help prevent the early motor failures, just like that. And when you say- And, and that so is a very typical DVDT filter, yeah. And that goes on the outlet? So D, is... Delta, uh -huh, that goes as close to the VFD as possible. And mm -hmm. in a multi-motor application, 
you would just size this guy for the total amps of your motors plus a little bit of service factor. If you had a, a 10 horsepower motor, or I'm sorry, a 10 horsepower drive that was rated at say 14, 15 amps, and you had five or six motors out there, then you would pick a one filter that was rated for that amount of current. You put it right at the output of the VFD before it went out to the motors. So in levels of protection and in levels of cost, then you would look at no output whatsoever, or you would look at some manufacturers have what's called DC bus chokes. And that works okay, but it's very limited into what it can do to help the output waveform going to the motors. You would have an output reactor. You would have this guy, a DVDT filter. And in the best world, you would have a sine wave filter, a true sine wave filter that is 100% top of the line, but it also is two to three times the money of what you're looking at on that filter. Hmm. No, you're looking at you're looking at the V1K, so that's a TCI, and you can look at TCI sine wave filter, and <coughs> uh, yeah, uh, let's see here, sine wave filters right there down below. Yeah, there you go. These are not good numbers, but you could you could look at a reactor that was one hundred and fifty dollars, and a DVDT filter would be. 300 to 350 dollars where a sine wave filter could start at 600 bucks and so they're for companies that have lots and lots of motors lots and lots of condensers these are outside of their prices their price market just because they're so expensive gotcha unless you have crappy power like but these put out yes these put out real sine wave filters so they are the bomb but not everybody can afford them if you only had a few applications and you had a lot of motor filter failures, it would be good. But again, sine wave filters are somewhat expensive. And of course, the larger your horsepower, the more expensive they're going to get as well. Gotcha. Now, we'll double back on a conversation that you and I had earlier on not only the carrier frequency, but the you were talking about measuring the output voltage of a VFD. So. Yes. If you look inside the VFD, there's going to be a what's called a motor block. You'll set up the parameters for your motor nameplate. Mm -hmm. So it will be, what is your motor frequency? In the United States, more than likely, it's going to be 60 hertz. Yeah. And what is the nameplate RPM? 1750 RPM. What is the full load amp? So you put that in. What is the nameplate voltage of your motor? And most, a lot of people just don't even look at that. So many motors inside the United States are going to be 460 volts. And so the VFD, let me see if I can get over to your, let me see if I can find your motor data. I think it's going to be in the 4, 4 one Let me go down. That's switching frequency. No. I'm almost there. Ah, too far. Three. Oh. Four dash. It might be three. Ah, killing me, Smalls. Mm -mm -mm. Three. Reference. Preset reference. Jog speed. Oh, yeah, that was with someone else. Uh, uh, active LCP, password, clock, load motor. Okay, uh, so it's going to be 1-20, 1-21, 1-22, 23, 24, and 25. Mm, what page on you know this is oh, page 198 121 here we go i'm looking yeah so yeah i'm looking at the very very end but you're in a better place because it describes each one of them so specifically i'm looking at 1-22 motor voltage okay get in there good 123 motor frequency will be 60 124 motor current will be full load amps but 1-22 is what i call important and it's it's often overlooked a standard motor will be 23460 so you can wind it for 460 volts and most mm -hmm. vfds as default will come out 460 volts and just leave it alone which means on a vfd you can only, basically, you can only get out the voltage that you put in. So if you're putting 
in 460, technically speaking, you're only getting 460 volt out of it, even though you're creating your own output voltage. You, you can't really raise it up a whole lot. And you don't want to, unless it's okay. low, like it's 440. Yeah. If the input voltage was 480, then a lot of people tell me that they put this setting, uh, motor voltage at 480, in the mm -hmm. hopes that they will lower the motor current that is consuming to do its job. Mathematically, that is correct. If you put 480 to a motor, it's going to pull a little bit less current because power is current times voltage. And so your total power being the same, the higher your voltage, the lower the current. The difference of 20 volts is not going to make that much difference. Sometimes people do that in an attempt to lower the current of your motor. I but feel many a motors on. are rated, <laughs> many motors are rated for 460 volts. And there are motors that were never meant to be used on VFDs. And you have a problem with them called oversaturation. So if the motor is made for 460, somewhere in the specifications, it will tell you, it won't tell you, but you'd have to dig for it. It will say the operating range for this motor is plus or minus 10% or 5%. But as you start getting higher, if that motor only wants 460 volts and it wants to operate and live within say 450 to 470, and you start getting 480, 485, 490, you're pushing 500 volts, then you could oversaturate the windings. You could create a problem with the magnetic field and it will actually pull more current than full load, overheat the motor, trip your thermals, and cause you all kinds of problems. There are motors that are inverted duty that are wound for 480. They're not going to oversaturate because they're built better than other motors that were not VFD rated. And so okay. as a general rule for this parameter, unless something is way out of whack, I always put this parameter at 460 because if it's in Texas and the input power is 500 volts, I don't want 500 volts going out to the motor. I want 460 volts going out to the motor. Under, in a bizarre case, I had a customer that, that had a 230 volt motor and it was only 230 volt, period. It, it wasn't a 230, 460. And that motor was 230 volt rated at 10 amps. And so he had a 460 volt VFD. That's all he had. And that 460 volt drive was rated for 10 amps. So it was twice the horsepower size of, of what he had. So he hooked up that 460 volt drive to 460 volts. He went to the motor parameter, put it at 230 volts, and he could supply 230 volts to his 230 volt motor because he had enough amps in that drive to supply it enough current to do its job. And he was off to the races and didn't have any problem. Now, oh, that is a bizarre uh, situation of, of what you use that for. There are certain motors that will come from overseas or they're nameplated 440 or 400. And they may be nameplated 440 at 50 hertz or 400 volts at 50 hertz or whatever. And you can go to that motor data block and put in 440 volts, 50 hertz at whatever RPM, and you have just made your VFD work with that European motor without hurting it. And, and that's part of the reason that these all have a motor data block is so you can fine tune the VFD for whatever motor you have, as long as you've got the amps to run it. And so at the end of the day, your VFD, instead of looking at it as a horsepower, you need to look at your VFDs as a box of amps because that's what you're using out of it. So, Kevin, I don't know if you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking about the Canadian bitsers that come in. So, my question, I, I guess you wouldn't know the, the sizing, because I don't know how they would end up sizing it if the motor was, has, it's 440 at 50 hertz. And you said if I basically drive it with 60 hertz, unless otherwise labeled on there, I could damage that compressor? On compressors, yes, because compressors will have a finite speed range. You don't want to, you don't want the bearings fly apart, and it's mechanically balanced for a certain speed range. So on okay. compressors, you wouldn't want them, you wouldn't want them operating below a certain speed, 
and you wouldn't want them operate above a certain speed because it's just not balanced and made to run at those speeds. Now, you could put in, if the motor nameplate was 440 at 50 hertz, you could put that into your VFD and everything would be good to go. Or what you could do is say, okay, 440 at 50 hertz is equivalent if you drew a linear line from zero, that's gonna be, let's say 460 volts at 60 hertz. And you could put that in. And so the linear relationship between hertz and volts would still equate to 440 at 50 hertz, even though you put in 460 at 60 hertz was your top. And then you could go into your maximum frequency and put it at 50 hertz. So you would never run that motor too fast and you would never put too much voltage to that motor and it would also run as well. There's two ways to skin that cat. I, I don't like saying this, but I'm lost. Because so, I, I heard you say linear right. and I was thinking how, how to actually plot the linear point on that. All right, so let me, this is the, one of the very first things you said. Mm -hmm. So we'll take an, we'll take 460 volts mm -hmm. divided by 60 hertz, right? Okay. So that's going to be 7.6 volts per hertz. All right, that makes right? sense. Okay, I'm there. So let's say you wanted to run that motor at half speed, 30 hertz. 7.66 okay. times 30 is 230 volts. At half frequency, that motor is going to be pulling basically 230 volts. Okay. So you would take a, a line. So if you had a right angle and you're looking at volts and hertz, you would have a line starting at zero going up to 460, and it would be at a 45 degree angle. It would be perfectly dissecting your voltage and hertz, right? From zero to 460 is zero to 60 hertz. I'm there. And at half speed, 230 volts, 30 hertz. So your 440 motor, 440 divided, 440 volts divided by 50 hertz is 8.8 .8 volts per hertz, right? Oh, okay. All right, I'm there. So that gives you the volts per hertz. So if you did that, let's see if I did this wrong. So 440 <laughs> divided by 50 is 8.8 .8 volts per hertz times 50. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you took that 8.8 .8 and times it by 60 hertz, you would come out with 528 volts, which, you know, you couldn't produce, but that gives you the linear line that you're after. So you wouldn't want 528 volts going to your motor at, at 60 Hertz. You mm -hmm. want 440 at 50 Hertz. So if you extrapolated that out, you're going to be, I don't have to sit here and figure it out. You would put in at 60 Hertz, 480 volts is probably what it's going to be 480. So 60 divided by eight. No, that's right. I did it right. You have your 440 motor at 50 hertz, right? Yes. If you wanted that, if you wanted that line to be linear, mm -hmm. you could put in four, 440 volts, 50 hertz into your motor nameplate, mm -hmm. or you could put in 60 hertz at 528 volts, which is 8.8 .8 volts per hertz. Okay. Then you would go into the maximum. And then you would go into maximum frequency and set it to 50 hertz. So your motor would never go over 50 hertz. It would never go over nameplate RPM. It would never go over 440 volts. But you've set your linear line, even though it was fictitious, your volts per hertz will still be on the same linear line going up to 60 hertz and 528 volts, even though you're never going to get there. Okay, but I would still in the if you if I have a European compressor and it has those numbers on there, I'm going to program the voltage and the frequency per, per that, correct? That is correct. You would put in 440 and 50 hertz. So the drive would just basically now, turn into a frequency converter one, at that point. Yes. Now, if you wanted that com that compressor to go faster, you could still use that linear line that you have set up with your motor data block 
and put it in your maximum frequency of say 50 hertz or i'm sorry 60 hertz but mm -hmm. in this particular case your vfd would never put out more than 440 volts so your compressor would actually lose power once it went over the 440 volts and the 50 hertz just like a regular motor would because you're starving it for voltage at that point gotcha if your compressor is rated for 440 you're not going to want to put 460 or 480 to it not for very long anyway and you can put in your motor parameters just like you got it off the nameplate off your compressor but you could put in your maximum frequency of 40 hertz or 50 hertz or 60 hertz and you could get more speed out of the compressor at less torque so your compressor would just have to be rated or overrated in that particular case to give you what you wanted to do in other words let's take a fan application if i have a five horsepower VFD on a five horsepower motor turning a fan blade on a condenser, then I'm going mm -hmm. to be producing the maximum amount of air that the OEM has designed for that combination, right? Okay. So let's say that, that let's say that motor is going 1200 RPM and the OEM has said at 1200 RPM, the airflow through this, through these coils, is going to be what we want to cool off the coils and keep your refrigerant at an acceptable level. Let's say it was really hot outside and the coils were a little bit dirty and you couldn't remove enough heat at 60 hertz. If your motor and VFD were sized correctly enough, mm -hmm. even though you're only putting out 460 volts to that motor, you could take your maximum frequency from 60 hertz to 62, 63, 65 hertz, mm -hmm. and you're going to lose a little bit of torque out of your motor, but you're going to be moving the fan blades and the airflow is going to be slightly increased. And as long as you have enough amps to supply the motor, and as long as you don't overamp your motor, I can get more airflow out of that situation beyond where the OEM designed it. Damn. So we're getting around some of the parameters that are defining this moment, which would be dirty coils or uh, fan blades are in the wrong position on the shaft, things like that. So this is a worst case scenario, but yes, it can be done. You can take, we've taken motors that were designed for 1800 and we've cranked them up to 4,000 RPM because we needed speed and not necessarily the torque out of the motor. I'm way off page now. No, you're fine. So back to this, to go though. Back to your... go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to talk yeah, about go the. Go back. Thing. To... Sorry, there's a delay. You're good. <laughs> yeah. To go back to your opening statement, then I would always look at the motor nameplate or compressor, whatever you had. And it's very mm -hmm. important to put that nameplate data into your motor data block because you may find out that it's not default in your case 440 volts may be on the nameplate that is not mm -hmm. going to be the default value in a vfd it's going to be 460 or 480 and you don't want to throw that voltage to a compressor if it's not rated for that so you should always check the motor data inside your vfd to make sure it's exactly what the nameplate on your motor is okay all right and that answers my question but the motor current now we're going to go, because we talked about the frequency, we talked about the voltage, the motor current. I know sometimes there's FLA, RLA. What are we using for that? For the motor current inside the parameters of the VFD, you should always use the full load amp rating of the motor. Motors will come out with, with a service factor, 1, 1.15, 1.25. And that's just going to tell you how well the motor is built and what kind of a service factor it has built into it. How much copper and cast and metal is inside that motor? How much can it take abuse? How much can it take overheating? But you should never take the full load amps and calculate 1.15 times 1.25 and put that into your VFD. You should always mm -hmm. put in full load amps directly into this motor current setting. And the VFD will have its own overload, if you will, service factor, timed overload built into the 
VFD. And so that's where your service factor is coming from is the VFD, not the motor. Okay. And again, even on that, you can put your clamp on, on the output of the VFD, and you can get a pretty good idea for amps. Amps are much easier to monitor on a meter than volts are because current is flow. And, but again, most VFDs will have a monitoring parameter and it will tell you what the amps are going out. And so it, it will keep your hands free. You don't have to put a meter on it or clamp on wires. At a glance, I can see the voltage and amps on the VFD and that will give me a good sense of load, what's going out there on the motor end. And again, we're after consistency. If you're looking at a single motor or multiple motors, and you're taking clamp-on readings, you want to measure all three on a one motor. If you have 10 motors, you're going to make 30 measurements, and you're after consistency. They should all, if they're all pulling five amps, they should all pull five amps. You're looking for a motor that's five amps, five amps, and 6.2 amps. And a motor that's out of whack could have some shorts inside the motor. The windings are starting to fail. They're still running, still look good but you might as well pull that motor offline because it's going to cause you some problems on the VFD because it'll be a phase imbalance to the VFD. Okay. Now I'm just going through some of the settings because there, there's another question I want to ask you, but I want to make sure I get everything out of here. Motor constant rated torque. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen that on a, on the bits or guide, unless I wasn't looking for it because that it says that it's measured in Newton meters. So have you ever had yeah. to change that? And what, and it, it, when, because I know there's constant torque and variable torque. And I think constant torque is like a, a fan motor, right? And am I wrong? And then compressors are, are variable. Yeah. Oh, op, yeah. Variable. Yeah. Constant torque will be like a conveyor or something that is consistent. Variable torque will be like a fan or a pump. There are certain fans and pumps that, that don't fit the variable torque application. There's what's called the law of affinity. And so, Variable torque applications, most fans, most pumps, the affinity law is if you slow it down a little bit, it, it will, it's not linear, it'll be the square. And so that's why there's such a cost savings on fans. If you slow them down 5%, you're actually going to save 10, 15% of your energy. That's why fans and pumps usually have a VFD on them is because your cost savings are, are so high on them. But yeah, constant torque would be a lot of your industrial applications, shaft turners, conveyors, the variable torque are going to be your fans and pumps, most of them. There are different kind of displacement pumps, and I'm not a pump guy, but there are some constant torque pumps, and there's some variable torque pumps. And I've never set the torque value of what you're looking at. Usually mm -hmm. that torque value is going to be, in Newton meters, a representation of the horsepower rating of either the VFD or the motor itself. So if you okay. put it in the other settings, you don't, you rarely have to worry about the torque value of that. I don't want to go through this whole thing, but there was a couple other questions. Kevin and I were talking the other week about adiabatic gas cooler motors where they actually have a setting that you can run you run the motor backwards and they do this to basically keep some of the heat inside the gas cooler under very low load conditions. So it doesn't, it doesn't basically keeps the heat in to keep the head pressure up. And I had an epiphany today. I was like, can we do that with a regular VFT? Because I saw a jog on there. Uh, Cause I, what is jog made for? And if we do have a reverse, we could eventually essentially run that VFT in reverse function just by putting a switch over there, yeah? That is correct. Can you just use the reverse uh, input? Yes, you could. If you give it a speed signal of any kind, zero to 10, and you give it a reverse command, it will go reverse at whatever analog speed you're giving it. Jogs, you can usually define as a positive reference or a negative reference. So you could say, I'm going to, you have, let's say you have five jog speeds. You can usually define them as positive or negative, and you could just toggle a bit and it will jog at that speed, whether it's positive or negative, forward or reverse. If you think about it this way, this is a cool trick that I've, that I've never done, but it did come up. In the condenser world, we did an experiment on a test drive where 
the fans are running all the time. And then once or twice a day for a couple of minutes, we built in a function inside the VFD. Most, some of the high-end VFDs, like the Danfoss FC-103 could do this, the, the Nidic Emerson M400, they all have some, the ability for you to put some code in them or some simple PLC functions. So twice a day, five minutes, you would slow the VFD down to zero, make it go reverse for five minutes at whatever, at 60 hertz, and you would blow all the garbage and bags and junk off the bottom of the coils and get them off the coils, and then you can go back to your regular function. <laughs> that never happens anywhere at a homework. Mm. Did it actually work, no. though, or no. did, was it? No. <laughs> uh, it was a novelty, and, and it didn't work every single time because a lot of times when it sucked up, the plastic bag would either get caught in the coils or semi-melt or get caught up in the coils themselves. And so blowing it backwards did not have the impact that they thought it would. So we didn't go with that. In your particular right. case, you could uh, jog it in the industrial world. Many people will call jog lace. So if you're setting up a machine, let's say your machine is making a paper product or any kind of paper product with multiple rolls. And let's say your sheet breaks or your web breaks, you would go to a jog speed or we call it lace and the operator, and it would be really low feet per minute, and the operator would grab the product, and he would put the machine on jog or lace, and he would actually hand feed the rolls with the product and go from roll to roll and, until he made it to the end of the machine. Everything was set up. He'd hit the go button. Then it would go to run mode and come out of jog. Jog is usually a setup or a lace to prep the machine to run full tilt or for some sort of testing process in my world. It can be used for whatever you want it to, but jog is usually a very low speed in order to allow the operators to do something to the machine that otherwise would be dangerous to do. Okay. No, like I said, I was just thinking places where Kevin lives where it gets stupid cold. I've had to put plastic on the top of the condenser to, to basically hold the heat in so that the head pressure doesn't tank and the wind could be so gnarly that it's just blowing through so i'm just wondering if, if there would be any bad things with being able to just give it a reversal and then being able to run it at x amount of hertz and just all there would have to do is just be a a, a change in why you know what we're doing you know what i mean as far as instead of trying to hold the head pressure by speeding up the fan, right? Usually that's usually what we're doing, basically running it to reverse in order to build the head pressure up. Cause by turning it down, you're just basically keeping that heat within the condenser and then being able to get that thing started. Cause all the air isn't brushing out all the warm air isn't going out, out the top of the head of the condenser shroud. Or do you think that would be a dumb idea, Matt? I'll yeah, leave to you. Be... Um... <laughs> I've never done that and never thought about that. And you could do it very simply because a lot of the basic commands, if you knew your VFD in the, in the situations that I'm familiar with, they only have a start command. That's it. So when they start, mm -hmm. they're going to go in the forward direction. So if you wanted to do what you're talking about, you would change that start command to a run forward command and a run reverse command. You'd have two inputs. One would be run forward, the other would be run reverse instead of a start. And that way you would have control over which direction it is. The good thing is if you were running forward wide open, you could give it a run reverse command immediately and you would not have to worry about breaking shafts off your motors because it would follow the D cell or ramp down rate it would go down at the rate that you had programmed it, and then it would ramp back up at the rate that you had programmed into it. So it would not be immediate and break the shaft off. If you had a 30 second ramp up rate, a 30 second ramp down rate, and you gave it a reverse command, it would take 30 seconds to go from 60 hertz to zero and 30 seconds to go from zero to not negative 60, but 60 hertz in the reverse direction. So you wouldn't hurt anything. If you, the only thing that pops into my mind, if you did go reverse for whatever application it was, you would just have to monitor your amps to make sure that your motor and your application, if it was going the opposite 
of the way it was designed, so to speak, you would make sure that you would have enough current to do that. Because instead of pushing air, you could be chopping air. And so it, the current draw out of your motor may be different. So in other words, if you're going forward at 60 hertz, you may only be able to go reverse at 50 hertz until you ran out of amps. Yeah, I wouldn't think you'd have to move that fan fast, right? You wouldn't have to move that motor that fast. All yeah. you're doing is trying to just keep the heat within, in between where the coil is and where I'm the actual so fan shroud is. What's that? I'm still convinced it doesn't work. I want to try it now. <laughs> I, I, we've <laughs> tried it. It doesn't, I, from what I've seen, it doesn't work. I still want to try it. I haven't seen it work. It, you're still moving air and it's still, I don't know. It's a novelty. Yeah, that was a thought. <laughs>